the art of poetry. We are all set for a blockbuster. With me is my co-producer, Gemma Mathewson from Guilford. I am thrilled that we're together again. Oh, me too. Gemma, you made me think of Mardi Gras, and that's coming up in a few weeks. Oh, I'm so, so, so thrilled with your hat. <coughs> Thank you. And I'd like to um, just subtly compete with you, but not really. Oh. This is uh, this is in honor of uh, May Sarton's European roots because it looks a little European to me. Belgian. Welcome everybody to the Art of Poetry. We've been cranking and roaring for a good six years now. I am very very happy to be back with Gemma, who really is just a, a gifted poet in her own right, but. Marvelous, marvelous in the criticism. So we have a lot of action for you today. Um, as usual, I'd like to start off with a very deep poem um, called Devotions. Really, um, it's a, a wonderful guy, John O'Donohue, who I usually open a show with. And uh, it sets the tone and the mood Quote, if you send out goodness from yourself, or you share that which is happy or good within you, it will all come back to you multiplied 10,000 times. In the kingdom of love, there is no competition. There is no possessiveness or control. The more love you give away, the more love you will have. John O'Donohue, what a gift he was to write that book, to bless the space between us. He calls them motivational devotions. I call them poems. He's a gifted poet, as on right. Today, we have two poets with a wonderful feminist zest embedded in their poetry. May Sarton and Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver's devotions and um, May Sarton, who came out with a book when she was 60. And a friend of mine, Woody, gave me this book, which was um, recently published and it's coming into 80. So we have a perspective on her long life, but particularly the last few years. So, May Sarton, what's your overall assessment, Gemma, of May as a poet? I... It was difficult not to compare the two poets, although comparing any two poets is probably folly. <laughs> but I, I really uh, resonated with May Sarton more for some reason. And um, as a poet, I think she just was she understood the gift of brevity, which is so hard to achieve. But also um, poetry from the heart on how the bond with nature really strengthens our understanding of um, the world. So that's where I begin. And that's where I feel you are absolutely right on with her. Um, let's learn a little more about her. Um, we've yeah. featured her earlier, in our earlier years. Um, she's the author of 17 poetry collections, long life too, 19 novels, 11 journals, two children's books, wow. But her poetry remains closest to her heart. 
This is from the latest gift from Woody, which is a stunner. Um, I'm so grateful that he keeps giving me these gifts that keep on giving. <laughs> um, this is from May Sarton's Well. Now it's edited as well by a person. Uh, and photographs are included. And the editor is Edith Royce Shade, S-C-H-A-D-E, from May Sarton's Well. And that well is deep, deep, as we are learning. Um, Gemma, yeah, quote, poetry remains closest to her heart. Quote, if I were in solitary confinement, I'd never write another novel and probably not keep a journal, but I'd write poetry because poems you see are between God and me. Wow, that gives me chills up the spine. Sarton has taught and read her poems in colleges, universities all over the country, holds 17 honorary doctorate degrees. Oh, May. But there's something special about May. Um, she was born in Belgium. Wow. And you know, emigre poets bring a whole different DNA of culture um, with them. So I'd like to read a poem or two, and Gemma would too. Um, I think, Gemma, what you said resonates with me very deeply about assessing her poetry. Um, and I wouldn't add a thing except that um, she has changed her style and her focus and topics. I've noticed after deep study over the last 20 years especially. So when she was younger, probably true of all poets, right? Generally understandable. They can start one way, but they can end up in a very different place. I'm not sure what we'll think about Mary Oliver in that way, but um, this is from toward the end of her life. I wanted poems to come. I wanted poems to come running and leaping. All they did was dream while I was sleeping. In the dreams, I could leap and run, feeling no pain. It was healing and resolution. I was given my life again. So what she's talking about is um, after a two-year hiatus, uh, dropping out of the act of writing and publishing, she um, missed it. So we're talking, wow, 82, after she turned 80. And um, I resonate with that because I'm 82 as well. So Gemma, in addition, I feel a certain, as you noticed and said to me earlier, there's a certain tuning fork going on for me with both of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially in their 80s. Um, it is interesting to see a po poets who have such a, a long um, uh, span in, in different eras and what they, uh, what keeps coming back to them too. Some of the poems, the themes keep coming back, but they're seen in such different angles or such different perspectives. So that's, it's really good to have poems, uh, poets with um, such a, a long history of um, being published. So um, the poem that I'm going to read uh, first, and this is why the whole headgear. Oh, excuse um, me. I've got to say, you yeah. have been just visited by the spirit of Emily. Oh, yes. Yes. This is my oh, that was wonderful. 
The cat said, like pay attention yeah. to me. We saw the paws. We saw the face. We saw the cat. Oh, that was wonderful. And, and she's not, not a, in the least bit shy as Emily, <laughs> as, her, as her namesake. Namesake Emily Dickinson. Oh, that was right. perfect. You can coach uh, a cat. <laughs> but um, as for May Sarton in uh, 1971, it was um, huh. an era where feminism was really starting to bloom yeah. in one of its iterations. And um, wow. the poem I want to read is The, the Muse as Medusa. Wow. And when people think of Medusa, they think of an ugly gorgon with um, a snake head. And the hero, uh, Perseus, chops off the head of Medusa and, you know, um, he uses it to, um, in, in myth, he uses it to, to uh, turn other people to stone because um, her, her gaze could turn anyone to stone, and Perseus blocked that with his shield. He wouldn't look at her face directly, but uh, uh, killed her. But if you go um, further about who Medusa was, she was a beautiful woman who was in Athena's temple and was uh, ravaged, raped by um, Poseidon. And Athena was so angry that she, she uh, gave her the snake heads and the, um, the whole curse. So it was a case of, in the uh, patriarchy uh, of those days, um, punishing the victim because she was the female and she was um, uh, obviously the person responsible for enticing um, the rape, which makes no sense at all, as we know now, but um, here is her poem. The Muse as Medusa. I saw you once, Medusa. We were alone. I looked you straight in the cold eye. Cold. I was not punished, was not turned to stone. How to believe the legends I am told? I came naked as any little fish, prepared to be hooked, gutted, caught. But I saw you, Medusa, made my wish that when I left you, I was clothed in thought. Being allowed, perhaps, to swim my way through the great deep and on the rising tide, flashing wild streams as free and rich as they, Though you had power marshaled on your side, the fish escaped many a magic reef. The fish explored many a dangerous sea. The fish, Medusa, did not come to grief, but swims still in a fluid mystery. Forget the image. Your silence is my ocean. And even now, it teems with life. You chose to abdicate by total lack of motion. But did it work? For nothing really froze. It is all fluid still, that world of feeling, where thoughts, those fishes, silent feed and rove. And fluid, it is also full of healing. For love is healing, even rootless love. I turned your face around, it is my face. That frozen rage is what I must explore. Oh, secret, self-enclosed and ravaged place. This is the gift I thank Medusa for. So May Starton is thanking Medusa for the insight of um, her experience that even after she um her head was cut off she gave um life to things in the sea and actually when she when she was uh, beheaded um pegasus sprang from her body so it it's a it's a story that's worth considering as um as women find their strength 
in love and love that's full of healing, even rootless love. What a that's line. Like, even rootless love. Yeah. I find that poem, as you read it, so full and so rich of imagery, too. And that seems to be a hallmark of May Sarton for me, except toward the end of her life. Um, not that she went into abstractions, but just that uh, there were less um, per inch, per page, of the rich, right. rich Im imagery. Um, thanks for that reading. That was really powerful. Um, oh, you're welcome. And uh, as you say, look at the perspective back in the days of ancient Greece, right up to the modern, with that added touch of European sensibility, I think. Right. Wow, what a great choice. And what a great hat to go with it. <laughs> wow. Um, so, uh, what a long life of production. And as I said, um, toward the end, things are very different from that poem you just read. Um, can you tell me the year she wrote that? Oh, 1971. Bingo. I, yeah. 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 So here's... here's it, it connects to the, to the zeitgeist of the time. The zeitgeist of the time, for sure. Yeah. After the 60s. And then um, in the 90s, when um, she started to slow down, um, and I think we have some visuals uh, of her by the fireplace. I, I'm not sure if Emily had a chance to get them up there, but we uh, can imagine her by the fireplace um, in her room, uh, comfortable at, at breakfast, and just uh, ruminating on a very, very long, rich life. Oh, there she is. Oh, I doesn't see. that look delicious, Gemma? Yeah, oh, looks good. That's good. Um, and uh, I think her mind is as quiet in these years as her body begins. And of course, walking with the pooch is wonderful. Um, and also we have a poem to go with her, um, her newfound focus, I think, after the two-year hiatus. I'll read quickly, though, what she says first about coming back to poetry after a two-year break. Um, how interesting. Uh, almost like a born-again-as-a-poet feeling here. Renaissance. For two years, the great cat imagination slept on. Ooh. Then suddenly the other day, what had lain dormant woke to a shower, a proliferation of images. My Himalayan cat sits on the terrace wall, back to the sea, his blue eyes wide open, alive to every stir of a leaf, every wing in the air, and I recognize him as a mage, um, like the Magus, uh, a book in the 70s. Yeah, I remember that. Do you? Great. Um, so, there she is by the fireplace. There she is walking, and uh, still her mind is coming up with images. We have a poem, um, which I may have to turn around to read, <laughs> um, if I'm not sure which one we're posting. But Emily, we're ready. That, that flash of a poem that you showed us with uh, the text and the picture a minute ago. Oh, isn't that beautiful? 
Um, Snowfall, with no wind blowing, it sifts gently down, enclosing my world in a cool white down, a tenderness of snowing. It falls and falls like sleep till wakeful eyes can close on all the waste and loss as peace comes in and flows, snow dreaming what I keep. Silence assumes the air and the five senses all are wafted on the fall to somewhere magical beyond hope and despair. There is nothing to do but drift now, more or less, on some great loveliness, on something that does bless the silent, tender snow. Oh, what a beauty that is. Snowfall. First in her poems, she, had, she, she values silence a lot. Silence comes up often in her poetry. And I think by silence, I, I, I interpret it as quiet. Uh-huh. I do. Because yeah. silence, to me, is, is, is a rare, rare thing. But quiet it is just... It, it, it better describes the, the lack of sound than silence, which cuts off even your own breathing, which is almost impossible to do. Um, and peace goes with it. Peace yes. and silence. Peace, peace, peace and quiet. Peace and quiet is right. Oh, I think right. that's a great, great clarification. But yeah. she said silence, and you know, I'm not. Yep. I'm not going to edit all these wonderful poems <laughs> edited out of it. No, no, um, please don't. Even it's though. It's a favorite of mine, too. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was going to say the same thing. I've noticed a few repetitive words, and silence is it. I agree with you um, in your understanding of where she's taking that. It was so beautiful to have that poem. Um, and. I think um, the key is aging, uh, and I'm facing it right now, face to face. Um, we'll, uh, we'll take a break after I read a few lines of birthday present, which is about turning 80. Um, I am 80 today. How can I have lived so long? Such a complexity of work, people, events. I ask myself in some dismay, and turn to the window to catch my dazzled eye, a scarlet tanager in the cherry tree. The last time I beheld that scarlet and black sumptuous bird was when I moved into this house by the sea 20 years ago. He flew to the flowering Andromeda. I have traveled so far through time to arrive at this moment awestruck. Oh, May, you nailed it. Um, and then, of course, she takes a break and has two years of uh, quiet and peace for her mind. And then, boom, she blasts out again. We're going to take a break, a short break with some very important service announcements. They're wonderful. And uh, see you on the other side. It was kind of the storm of the century or the 500 year um, flood or storm that um, by some estimates over 15 inches of rain fell over a three day period on June 4th, 5th and 6th, 1982. What is pickleball? The sport that has captivated millions with its combination of tennis, badminton and ping pong can be played one on one or two on two. Hi, thanks for joining me. This is a Temer Selectman's update. Hello everyone, Carl Fortuna here, 
again with another monthly update. Today's the Town Council regular meeting, Wednesday, October 4th, 2023 at 8 a.m. Town Hall Green Room. We will move on to the minutes of September 5th. Good music in the interim. Whoa, what a service announcement. Congratulations. I saw Anne Marie in there. Gemma, we can't Sprank. leave her yet. Okay, Be I'm happy to not leave her yet. Before <laughs> Very happy. we could and be true to the inspiration that comes from our pets, especially our cats. You, you so deeply know that. So she wrote luxury. Oh, good. My cat, Pierrot, the eloquence of his sleep, tucked under the ample breast, his paws are two velvet pillows. His thick furred boots stretch out in luscious abandon. His colors are blue gray and silvery white. He purrs lightly embroider the air. No emerald, no mink muff, no ermine vest could provide the luxury of this cat's sleep. How rich I am. Oh, oh that's, yeah. Yeah, man. If you're a cat person, that really resonates. That's, a, that's beautiful. I don't really have anything to comment about that except Again, it's just enough. It's, it's just enough. It's just enough. And again, um, these are from her later years. Um, can, I, can I read one that I would like to um, it, it resonate with me quite a bit? Uh -huh. Of course, the cat one does too. But um, it, it, brought back a memory to me, but first I'll read the poem because it's just so, um, and, and what, it, what an art poetry is that it can, um, it can reach different parts of your brain that you thought were lost to you, like certain memories that you may have thought completely gone. Ah. Um, this is called On Being Given Time. And, um, this is from later in her life. Sometimes it seems to be the inmost land all children still inhabit when alone. They play a game of morning without end, and only lunch can bring them startled home, bearing in triumph a small speckled stone. Yet even for them, 
too much dispersal scatters what complex form the simplest game may hold. And all we know of time that really matters, we've learned from moving clouds and waters where we see form and motion lightly meld. Not the clock's tick in its relentless bind, but the long ripple that opens out beyond the duck as he swims down the tranquil pond or when a wandering falling leaf may find and follow the formal down path of the wind. It is perhaps our most complex creation, a lovely skill we spend in a lifetime learning, something between the world of pure sensation as if we held in balance a globe turning. Even a year's not long, Yet moments are, this moment, yours and mine, and always given when the leaf falls, the ripple opens far, and we go where all animals and children are. The world is open. Love can breathe again. Oh. So that's... That's You're, the gift of time to be able to imagine and, and just uh, bond with and kind of grok with and understand um, what we see and, and internalize it. And, but time, I just wanted to say what this, what little spark this, this gave to me. Oh, I, I worked in early childhood education as, as you, as you know, but, um, one time there were three little boys who uh, they, they, hadn't, they were shy at the beginning of school, but then they started playing together and they were, they were wearing fireman hats and they were zipping all around doing fireman things. And I thought, oh, good, finally, they're, they're reaching, you know, they're coming out of themselves and they're playing. And then all of a sudden I saw them sitting over on chairs, stiff and straight, and they weren't doing anything. In my mind, they weren't doing anything. And I thought, uh-oh, what's going on? I went, I went over and I said, hi, guys, uh, what's up? And they said, oh, we're, we're waiting to hear the alarm bell. So they incorporated time into their play. Like the firemen aren't always rushing about. They understood, they understood that they, there was a time of waiting and listening. And, and that was such a beautiful moment in their development that I thought, oh, okay. That's even better than the socialization. It's the understanding of, of the intervals. Oh, what a sensitive example that is. That's marvelous. Thank you. It just, it just came into my head, you know, that I was so relieved they were playing together, but it didn't occur to me that they could stop and wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a winner. Yes. Yeah. Oh. And, um, but it's... But, more to the point, that this is the art of poetry. When, poet, when the poet gets her point across uh -huh. and in such a way that these ripples keep rippling oh, in your own understanding. Yes. Oh, that's, I had to um, really reflect for a moment how brilliantly you read that poem with so much clarity, pause, and feeling. Um, Thank you. That was brilliantly read, as you usually do. But there seemed to be really um, a deep feeling within you coming through in that poem. Um, but it's easy to do with, with a poem like this because uh, even the words, the long ripple is, is a, such a, a... And it's contrast with the tick and relentless bind because, again, this is the art of poetry. It's how the words are used to convey exactly what the poet's getting across. So um, I guess when I, for a long time I read poetry and I never went to an open mic and I didn't realize how much the sound of the words incorp it can be and is incorporated into the meaning. And um, it's it's a whole different thing. It's how poetry started, really, mm -hmm. being um, recited out loud. 
I'm so glad you noted that about her because um, her gift is uh, a poet's ear. And really, she is so talented in the musicality of it and uh, has to be read aloud as you've done. And it comes through. Um, I'm so glad you've, you've added that because, yeah, many of us get stuck in the poem on the page, but it's really music that it's all about. And she's got it. Only she needs to be read aloud as you just did. How exciting that was um, to think about your memory being triggered and coming up, infusing the poem too. Um, and you've really nailed it in terms of the art of poetry. That's what the show is for, um, for really demonstrating not only the musicality, but the magic of it all coming together. And uh, when you read, that's what it does for me. You know, it's the magic that comes together, especially with Mae Sarton. Um, and I think that's why I keep going back to her. And I think that's why Woody, my dear friend, keeps giving me these books, you know. Um, yeah. Gestalt at 60, that was that one. Then uh -huh. coming into 80, isn't that a good way of putting it? Um, coming into 80. Also, um, she has played with the theme of time before in very creative ways. So besides silence, the other word that I seem to find her saying uh, is that time. Time is essential um, as a concept in her poems as she um, really uh, teases out the meanings for us. Uh, what a wonderful poet to be um, spending more than a half hour on. <gasps> <laughs> um, and I will read a couple of lines. Okay. Bliss, in the middle of the night, my bedroom washed in moonlight and outside the faint hush hushing of an ebbing tide, I see Venus close to the waning moon. I hear the bubbling hoot of a playful owl. Pierrot's purrs ripple under my hand, and all this is bathed in the scent of roses by my bed, where there are always books in flowers. Ah, in the middle of the night, the bliss of being alive. Oh, May, you said it. She's all after 82 writing this thing. Oh, can I resonate with that? I'm still alive. I'm still upright after a year of illness. Uh, maybe that's why she affects me so deeply in the marrow of my bones in these collections. So um, there's Gestalt at 60 coming into 80. And from May Sarton's well, oh, it takes my breath away. Yeah. Now it's 15 minutes left, and I think we can do we can do more May if you'd like. I, um, and just I'd like to come back you? to May someday. Okay. With you. Okay. That's what the feeling is deep inside me. Um, I don't want to let her go, and you know you are doing for me what uh, perhaps the best criticism would ever be of uh, putting out all sides to me. But to the leaf that was on the floor a minute ago, that Captain Mike came over and picked up, and Anne Marie had spotted it, you know, because Anne Marie's a perfectionist. She has this <laughs> set all. And she's, what's this fall leaf doing on the floor, right by the music stand? Wow. Well, that's what poetry is, too. It's the synchronicity that you and I experience when we open our hearts and minds to the moment. 
Yes. Wow. And somebody else I know has that capacity. Okay. I don't know if you ever heard of this, but this transformed my life. Can you believe that Mary Oliver, the, you know, very popular and um, in many ways the, the same um, gifted artist in many ways that May Sarton was. And Mary Oliver just died recently, two years ago maybe, at the most. Um, and I was walking with a buddy on the streets of P-Town and he disappeared for a minute. And he went into this um, bookstore and he came out. And he came out with this title. Oh my goodness, Mary Oliver, Rules for the Dance. What? Now I taught poetry for many years, but I'd never, never been taught so well the art of poetry by anything but this book. Ah. Who knew? Who could know? Because she's so popular in so many um, conventional ways, almost like Billy Collins whose name just keeps kicking around because he's so popular with general reader. Um, so we're not talking Mary Oliver as the academic poet who talks only to himself <coughs> and to others like him. Mary Oliver's the real thing, you know, just as Mae Sarton is. And I think maybe for you too, although I love the fact that you said, wait a minute, She's not quite accurate on the facts. Oh, and you perked my ears up when you did that. I'm ready. Give me the yeah. facts, ma'am. Ma'am, give me the facts. Only the facts. Well, it's, I mean, if you're going to start with a fantastical premise, it should be a fantastical poem, but I don't know. <laughs> But, so, I, I checked myself though. I'm gonna just read you the short poem I was talking about. It's very, very short. <clears throat> she wrote a lot about um, egrets and swans and birds of all kinds. Oh, I saw but, yesterday all the egrets and swans you'd ever wanna see. I'd have yeah, a but in 2009, she wrote Snowy Egret. It said, a late summer night and the snowy egret has come again to the shallows in front of my house, as he has for 40 years. Do not think he is a casual part of my life, that white stroke in the dark. But I said, does that, does that make sense? I didn't think egrets live that long. I know some, uh, uh, for instance, parrots and uh, toucans and things like that live a much longer life. but. I Googled it, of course, and their, uh, their lifespan is 20 to 22 years, 24 on the outside. So <clears throat> in her mind, it's the same snowy egret. I, I guess I just have to accept that, that she wants it to be the same egret because in her mind, it symbolizes something that doesn't go away. It's the same thing, even though it's not the same bird. But Somehow it's, it, it jars me because it, it's, it's not the same bird. That's the scientist well, I have in to you. Say that, oh, that's the scientist in you, Gemma. Yeah, I have I to say that. that I see a nuthatch outside my window. I've lived here for 35 years and I see nuthatches on the feeder and I say, oh, there's my nuthatch. Although I know it's not the same one, and I would never write a poem by saying that same nuthatch has visited me for the last 35 years. <laughs> and you're so right. I mean, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's, um, that's part of the true story of the art of poetry. And yet this is probably better than any academic could ever have written. Yeah. 
You know, I, so I, you know, she's she's got a range that's so so big, just like Mae Sarton. You know. Yeah, I mean, I had a person when I was when I was um, what's the word? Workshopping one time, uh, some erudite, very not a, you know polite uh, uh, gentleman said to me, uh, "You're referring to that." Uh, Python is reticulated. I don't think that's a good adjective for pythons. And I said, well, it's not mine. It's it's the scientific name that they go by, reticulated Python. So uh, sometimes if you fact check a poet, it, it doesn't work to your advantage. So just saying. And just saying, you're absolutely right, because that um, dramatizes the sometimes a necessary conflict between the scientist and the artist, you know, because right. we're all in it in one world and we're all in it yeah. together. <laughs> right, oh, right, right. Really? So, um, yeah, I would love to uh, see, uh, have you uh, loan me that. I, I, that's one I'm not familiar with. I'd be delighted. Oh, you are going to be so stellar when you come back from that book. <laughs> In your, Maybe I won't have two left feet. Oh, no. Um, a little late for that. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to hear a little more of Mary Oliver's um, poetry. Do you have anything else that you have with you? Yes. I do. Thank you. Would you like gold finches or would you like... Um, one of her more uh, well-known wild geese. Oh, I let's like go with the wild geese. That is so good. Yeah. This is a very favorite one of hers. Um, wild geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it <coughs> loves. <coughs> Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you about mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Oh, thank you. I love that one. Harsh and exciting. That, that is just the geese. That is just... You know, uh, I, I, I mean, to, to even start to begin to try to analyze a poem like this almost seems so unnecessary because it's, it's on a visceral level that you can hear and understand that sound and, and relate it to the the fact that nothing really compares to what all the things you might prepare to do to enrich yourself or understand life in, um, beyond being absorbed in. And she affects me that way on the visceral level. That's where mm -hmm. uh, she grabs me. Um, and also in the sense of um, her aging and her um, coming to terms with uh, slowing down, growing older, um, maybe uh, really more awareness of um, the spiritual side of life. But again, it is for May, uh, for May and I think also um, really for her in 
in the, the visceral feelings they get from nature. Mm -hmm. and, right. And, the, the, three, the one word that's repeated three times in the poem is meanwhile, meanwhile, meanwhile. Uh -huh. And meanwhile, that's where nature happens in all the meanwhiles. The uh, things are happening around you, no matter what your intention is focused on, it happens in the, in the meanwhiles, in the here and now, in the sound of the geese flying overhead, and, you know, the things that we can, we can tune into. And as May says, that's the peace and quiet you need in order for the meanwhile to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I love Mary Oliver with a depth of um, feeling that is even deeper than uh, my love for Mae Sarton's poems. Um, it's just that it's, it's so, um, I'd say, uh, <clears throat> my, my sensibility for nature. And, wow. and that's where I resonate. Um, and, and a less cerebral approach, um, and again, it's hard to generalize over lifetimes, but the two of them have um, certainly lives that we can compare, but also, more importantly, contrast. And that's the joy, I think, of coming back to them over and over. Um, and, and you've noticed, certainly, that you and I have gone deeper and deeper in the vernacular we peeled the onion now almost to its core um, and yet there's still a way to go isn't there oh, oh there's always a way to go honey. oh my goodness yes um so, the world's full of poets do you have um one of your own hanging about um one of your own poems hanging about that may have um come up in your mind during this show? Um, just... Oh, I, don't, I don't really have a poem of my own this time. Maybe, maybe next time. I would love that. I mean, you know, just sort of on the side, depending upon the topic or whatever. But it's so nice that you have that book out, plus um, the, the wonderful uh, response you've gotten, uh, certainly from Victor et al. and, uh, and company, including me. Um, oh, yeah. I was wonderful, 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 wonderful. And you know, um, this is making me think of you. Um, you're far from 80, but... <laughs> <laughs> Not that the, far. The maturity and the wisdom. Um, in, in the last couple of moments we have, I just like to say that the two of them have distilled in their very last years a kind of wisdom and presented it to me in their books um, and also in the readings that we hear out loud, um, the wisdom of a long, long life um, distilled as a poet. What would you say? We've got about a minute left um, that is yeah, your... I think I think when I read, when I see the later works of both of them, I think one thing that keeps coming back again and again is, oh, it's not, it's not me against the world. It's me um, with myself. How to be? How do I learn to be with myself? Have I learned to just be with myself inside this great big place, rather than? worrying about all the different uh, interactions that uh, just can overwhelm any human being. Just being at peace with that. I was just going to say, and the, we're, the operative word is peace. Yeah. Peace. Being inner, at peace. Yeah. Inner peace. The peace that comes with understanding. It's inner at peace, a, yeah. At a deep, 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 deep level. Oh, this is so wonderful. We are now coming to the wrap. I'm going to say goodbye for now. Goodbye. Thank, thank you, Thank you everyone. for the best show we've ever had, ever. 
I'm <laughs> telling you, oh my God. I'm going to lift off. Hey, bye-bye.